right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday night class. Good to have you here tonight. Uh, we're going to finish up uh, verse 6 and then get into verse 7 uh, of Proverbs 22 tonight, so we'll get right into that. Uh, no announcements uh, to make other than Communion Sunday. Uh, this coming Sunday, plus daylight savings time, so our turning clock's back, fall back, uh, and we'll do that on Sunday. All right, um, anything else, anything, any requests or any other announcements? All right, nothing, nothing, nothing. All right, uh, Sue? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sandra, okay. All right, so we'll continue prayers for Sandra, who's been in a coma for some time, had a surgery uh, this past week as well, so uh, we'll keep her in our prayers in the coming days. All right. All right, so let's get started then as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1, nine, the rebound technique to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and now to glorify you through the study of your word. And Father, we just can't thank you enough for all that you have done for us and our families and for our church, for providing for our every need, both physically and spiritually. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers us and enables us and teaches us your word. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who has given us your word, and also who continues to be our mediator and advocate on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for your great plan for our salvation, past, present, and future, and the will and plan that you do have for our lives that we can walk in each and every day. So, Father, we glorify you and praise you, and we thank you for this time of being gathered together this evening to study and teach your word. We ask that this word be meaningful and powerful within our lives. Father, we pray uh, this evening for uh, those victims and uh, the survivors of the, uh, uh, the shooting in the uh, synagogue down in Pittsburgh, and we just ask that you continue to be with all of their family members, Father, and give them strength and courage by your word and through your Holy Spirit, according to your will. We continue to pray for our nation, our police, our firemen, our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world as well, and ask that you be with all of them and protect and guide them and lead them all in their endeavors to be successful and safe. We thank you, Father, for their service and for their sacrifice. And we have special prayers tonight for Sandra and her uh, battle the coma that she's in and the surgery that she underwent this week and we just ask that you bring healing and recovery in her life we ask that you be with cheryl and her mom out in oregon and help her mom to continue to recover uh, from her uh, fracture in her upper arm we also pray for my son ben and his travels back to colorado and ask that you continue to give him pl travel blessings in the coming days and keep him safe in those times so father we thank you for answering our prayers, and we ask that you continue to lead us and guide us. And now lift up our hearts in song and in praise, in Christ's precious name, amen. And if Terry would like to come forward for our doxology. <coughs> Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son, we give thanks, we give thanks. And thank you, and please be seated. <coughs> Yeah, all right, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs 22. 
Uh, and tonight we're going to finish up uh, verse 6. We uh, got uh, about halfway through uh, verse uh, twenty, uh, verse 6 uh, on Sunday morning. And I've just got a few more things to share with you. And then we'll uh, get through cha- uh, verse 7 as well this evening. And we'll see the principles that come forward from there. But going back to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1. It reads, a good name is to be more desired than great riches. Far or favor is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse, He who guards himself will be far from them. And now in verse 6, what we're finishing up tonight, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So that is our phrase that we're understanding about training in the principles and precepts of God's Word to the child, or we could also say to the immature individual, especially the immature believer, so that they can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and eventually reach adulthood, and especially for the believer, spiritual adulthood within their lives. And as they do, they'll continue to rely upon those principles and precepts that you taught them or the parent taught them during their walk. So the principle that we left off with is that that parents are to initiate and dedicate the child to walk in spiritual adulthood to perform divine good production while they are in spiritual perfection. Again, in the church age, spiritual perfection means being filled with God the Holy Spirit and applying the Word of God on a consistent basis. And being filled with the Spirit is the result of the confession of our sins, the rebound technique found in 1 John Chapter 1 in verse 9. And as we've seen in the Word on Sunday, that fantastic word, uh, kanak, understanding that it means to initiate, to dedicate, to inaugurate, to train. In other words, give them the information that is necessary and then turn them over to God, giving them what is needed in the spiritual life to go forward and walk in the plan of God as they have the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ within their soul. So we pick it up this evening talking about that word child. I just wanted to mention that briefly because this also goes along with the greater context that we're seeing in this passage. Yes, we could say parents and ch- uh, should be teaching and training their children in the ways of God. That is an absolute for the believer and the uh, church family. <clears throat> But this word that we have in the Hebrew does mean child, but it also can mean a young man and sometimes even a servant. So when we expand this word a little bit beyond just the child, we're seeing the greater context of the immature believer who has now entered into the family of God, who are spiritually immature in the fact that they don't know the word of God and aren't applying it in their life. They are a young individual in the plan of God. And at the same time, as you know, from the day of your salvation, salvation, you are entered into the servanthood of God. But you don't know how to be a servant right away because you don't have the word resident within your soul. So you need to learn that word, grow in that word, and understand what that is to grow to maturity, spiritual maturity, and then apply it for yourself. So this is not a reference specifically to a child related to a parent, but more importantly, it is in regard to the social status of an individual. Not necessarily talking about an age category, but the social status. The one that doesn't have the status of adulthood. They don't have the status of being able to go off and, you know, uh, sign contracts or enter into business on their own. They can't conduct, you know, the, the general aspects of society without parental guidance and supervision. But now, so that's the individual that we're talking about, that immature, the one that is not able to do those things. They are the ones that need to be trained. They need to be taught so that they don't ultimately fall into the various categories of sin and allow the sin nature to take control of their soul and fall into the problems of self-induced misery, the thorns and snares that we've been talking about. So that's what's in view here. Not not just a child, but somebody who is in a lesser social status compared to the adults of the society. So we, he, we take away from that is that we're talking about young and immature individuals, new believers, and as you know, we need to train them up. The pastor teacher has that responsibility 
from behind the pulpit as part of the church to train up the believers within that local assembly so that they learn and understand and then can apply the Word of God consistently. But remember, as part of our general ministry, every believer who knows anything about the Word of God has the responsibility to train and teach others in that. So this talks to our general servanthood that we ought to train those new believers who have come into our periphery so that they can grow to spiritual adulthood and therefore perform divine good, walk in spiritual perfection on their own. Then we understand in the, in the phrase, in the way he should go, going back to verse 6, let's look at it again, train up the child in the way he should go. I give you this phrase again because it also uses some interesting Hebrew words here. And we have in, in and that's basically just a particle or, uh, that we have within the Hebrew language. But the word for way he should go is made up of two Hebrew words, the first being peh and the, and the second being Derek, okay? And we've seen these words throughout the book of Proverbs thus far in our past teachings. They are very familiar words to us, but it's interesting the way it should go has to do with these two words. Now, Derek by itself would have been suffice because ultimately it talks about the way, the manners, the customs of somebody, how they function, how they operate, the road in which they are walking upon. Derek does that all by itself. But then we have this other word, peh, that is given to us in the, Gre in the Hebrew that really talks not about the way he should go, but it's really used for the mouth. The speech of somebody, what is coming forward from their mouth. Sometimes it talks about the opening or the edge because talking about the mouth and the opening and the edge of the mouth being the lips. Sometimes it's used in those categories and or classifications and can have some nuance in that vein as well. But when we have in the way he should go translated in the English, it's pa Derek, and basically these two words are combined together to talk about the way of their life and how they're going to walk after they grow up, after they reach the stage of adulthood and now are performing on their own. Not being under the parent's tutelage or parent supervision or guardianship, but now being on their own. How are they going to function? How are they going to operate? And by throwing the word pet in there, we see something fantastic because what the context is all about are the words that are coming from their mouth. So even though we're talking about the life that they're going to live as an adult and we taking it to the spiritual uh, uh, realm, the life that they're going to live as a spiritual adult, basically it's talking about the speech that they use in that life and in that lifestyle. So the way they should go, we could really say how they use their language throughout the rest of their lives. And that's what's in view here. And so what we see is an emphasis on verbal communication and th the avoidance here of sins of the tongue. That's really what's in view here. The way they should go is really talking about avoiding sins of the tongue that will cause what? Thorns and snares within their life causing them to have self-induced misery because they've said something wrong or they've done something in a lying way or a gossiping way or a maligning or slandering or an abusive thing that they've done with their mouth. Basically, that's what's in view here, the way that they speak going forward. Yes, it talks about the overall lifestyle so that they're trained up to live as spiritual adults, but basically it's emphasizing how they talk, the language that they use and the words that are coming forward from their mouth. And we could even kind of take that in, in, a, in a more general sense of are they speaking in terms of what? Bible doctrine. Are they speaking the mind of Christ? And are the words coming out of their mouth edifying and lifting up to other individuals? As we also recently have talked and uh, studied in the latter part of the book of Ephesians, how are they using their speech? And the book of Proverbs talks about that greatly, where it says we are to use poor speech, but instead we are to have that good speech, that edifying speech, that uplifting, exhorting speech, if necessary, to reprove and rebuke with our speech. But we do it in a loving way, in a caring way, not to 
hurt somebody or to harm them, but to help them to understand the wrong that they're doing so that they can make a change and go forward within their lives. It's really talking about the avoidance of verbal sins, but with the emphasis of the exhortation, how they use their words, how they speak. And as we look at the micro context of what we're seeing here in Proverbs chapter 22, it's all about the rich and the poor, isn't it? This whole phrase, and actually verse 7 that we're going to get into in just a minute, gives us another analogy between the rich and the poor. And as we saw back in, uh, what was it, verse 2, the rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. So really it's in regard to how they think about people and life and in general society. And what we can take away from this is that the way we speak says a great deal about the way that we think. And we understand that. And the words that come out of our mouth are typically what's going on in the mentality of our soul. That's why we need to have the Word of God resonant within our soul so that we don't have the garbage of sin and Satan's cosmic system rattling around up there. Because if we do, that's what's going to come out of our mouth. What we're thinking is what's going to come through our words. And if we're thinking in terms of Bible doctrine, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? How would he function and operate in this situation? That's what's going to come forward from our mouths as we are speaking uh, to one another. So again, in the way he should go is emphasizing that. The speech that is coming forward that starts with the mentality of our soul, that begins with the mind of God or the word of God resident within the soul. And it all completes the analogy. So that's what we, what's in view. And in the context of the rich and the poor, looking at everyone as one. Not treating one better than the other, giving them equal privilege and equal opportunity to advance and excel in the spiritual life and also in general society. We know by having freedom like the United States of America has fantastic freedoms that everybody has the same privilege and opportunity to go forward and either succeed or fail. And success or failure is many times determined by the decisions that people make and the words that come out of their mouth, but sometimes it's not. We understand that. We talked about that about a week or so ago. Sometimes just bad things happen and bad things come into somebody's life regardless of their decisions and their volition. But in generality, we have freedom. And we shouldn't be holding one group down while we raise up another. And we should be giving everybody freedom and opportunity just as our Constitution calls for. And that reminds me, and uh, nobody said anything today about my beautiful new haircut that I got today. See the nice little part that I got there today? Went to a barber shop down, uh, down on the other side of town and uh, got my hair cut. And um, what's interesting about the uh, barber shop is that basically all the barbers are foreigners. There's very few... English individuals there. And most of them are Lebanese, and there was another Puerto Rican guy, as he classified himself, and uh, they were all talking and bantering and whatnot. And uh, the uh, gentleman that was cutting my hair was Lebanese uh, descent and now in America. And uh, we were talking about various things and whatnot, and he made a great comment that I wholeheartedly agree. He says, you know what? People in America, they don't know how good they have it. The freedoms that you have, the opportunities that you have, you have no idea. You know, most people have no idea. And I said, oh, no, I get that. I understand it, you know, and and supported that comment wholeheartedly as as he put it forward. And coming from a Middle Eastern country and the things that may be happening are going on there. He also said another thing. He said, don't believe what's on the news. Hmm, Somebody else says that a lot lately, too, don't they? Uh, Called our president. But he says, don't believe what you see on the news, especially about the Middle East. He says, it's not like that at all not like that at all. He said, don't believe what you're seeing out there, okay? But he did emphasize the difference between society and the freedoms that we have and the opportunity that we have. And that comes from the great constitution that we had that was written by our founding fathers who were a majority of believers, a vast majority of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they had Bible doctrine in their soul when they drafted the constitution. And they wanted to create a godly society, not a theocracy like Israel had or like they tried to do under, um, I'm going to forget his name right now, over in Sweden and all that. No, I can't see. I'm terrible with names. But um, one of the great uh, reformers of of, uh, uh, the the Middle Ages, not Luther, but um, 
And I forget the other guy's name, but I'll think of it when I don't really try to think about it. But in any case, you know, they tried to create theocracies, you know, in the Middle Ages. Total failure. Because that's not God's design for the general population. It was His design for Israel, not for anybody else. Nor does, does the Bible say anywhere, have a theocracy. But it does give us principles and precepts to abide by. It gives us great laws that we should have in our society and hold up. And ultimately, our forefathers saw these things, knew these things, and instituted them, coming from tyranny themselves, so that generation after generation could have fantastic freedom. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we're seeing in this chapter of Proverbs 22, it's all about continuing that heritage, continuing the freedom, looking at everybody as one. Yes, there's going to be rich, there's going to be poor, but that doesn't mean we have to hold up on high the rich and we just kick, you know, like a dog, the poor. Give everybody the same opportunity. And if somebody needs a helping hand, give them a helping hand. But don't hold them down. And unfortunately, you know, the mode of operation of our government in these uh, last, you know, a few decades has been to what? S dis distinguish the classes like never before and really have, you know, the rich and then have everybody else as poor and have a government that is the, you know, sugar daddy for everybody. And again, that doesn't give opportunity for the poor, nor does it give opportunity for the rich. It doesn't treat them as one. We treat them as different classes now. And we have all different kinds of programs and principles that just keep making that worse and worse and worse. And our current president is trying to rectify a lot of those things, but Congress gets in the way half the time, and we can't allow it. All right, I'll get off the politics, all right? But in any case, the rich and the poor, we have one thing in common. We have a common maker. God is the maker of us all. So we need to recognize the power of our words. We need to educate other people so that they know the word of God. They understand the freedoms. And in a society like ours that has already called for those freedoms to ring, we need to give people the information for the foundation of those freedoms so they continue to walk and talk in those freedoms and not be put in a position of tyranny with a socialistic or even communistic type of government that does not have and provide for freedom. So in any case, we must recognize the power of our words. We have the power to educate others about decisions. And when we can educate <coughs> individual about the decisions that they make that affect the less fortunate and to speak out for justice when necessary, we're doing a great thing. And if we see injustices, we should be speaking up. But if we can teach people about what true justice is from the Word of God, we'll have even a better society than we had before. That's part of what we're seeing here about teaching the child in the way he should go, how he should speak, how he should function, how he should operate, so that freedom can continue to ring. We must teach the coming generation to care about the concerns of others. And that's something that, you know, just very, very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Subtly, that's the word I'm looking for. Very, very subtly with technology. We're teaching our children not to care about anybody but themselves. Because it's all about this that's right there in front of them. Okay? And that is just an extension of their head. And then they, you know, they see all this other stuff that's out there, but they really don't care. It's a very impersonal thing because they're just talking to themselves as they talk to the phone that's right in front of them. And so we're teaching a generation that cares less about other individuals. And so we need to teach them, again, to care for the rich and the poor. We need to train them up so that their words continue to provide for freedom and justice for the rich and the poor. And if we encourage the new generation to love generosity, to love justice, we have done a job well. We've done our jobs very well. And that goes along with what it says in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And I'll just read that. And interesting, this comes up in the next passage of Proverbs as well. But in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, again, if you're familiar with this, so I'm not going to have you turn there. It says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. 
caring, providing, not taking and stealing and, uh, you know, saying that, oh, I, I think I should have it or I want it more than you, so therefore I'm going to take it from you, whatever that may be. How we use our words, how we talk to each other, how we uh, uh, treat justly within our, our country all depends on having the Word of God, the mind of Christ, resonant within our soul. And that's why we need to continue to teach the Word to the next generation and the next generation so that we can continue to have a pivot of believers where God is able to bless the nation through those believers as they operate in freedom and in love and in generosity. <clears throat> Train up the child in the way he should go. Utilizing his speech, utilizing his words, his actions, their thought process of having the Word of God resonant within the soul. And what's interesting about the word mouth being here, uh, we also take away the principle, is that more often than other categories of sin, the sins of the tongue lead us into those thorns and snares, as we've read already in these previous passages, which talk about the uh, sin and being part of Satan's cosmic system. More often than not, our mouths get us into trouble than any other thing. Many times your thoughts don't get you into too much trouble unless your thoughts become words and actions. But many times you're just keeping your thoughts to yourself. It doesn't really hurt you too much or it doesn't hurt anybody else. It doesn't necessarily have a boomeranging effect to you, although that's where it all starts. But when those thoughts come through your mouth in a negative way or in a sinful way or in a cosmic system type of way, when those words start to come from your mouth, that's when we can start to create all kinds of problems for ourselves. That self-induced misery as a result of the words that we have spoken. And just the fact, you know, many times when we think about these things, we, you know, maybe we're talking about egregious words and slanderous words and, you know, this type of, you know, you know various evil things like that. We think of the big picture evil things. But many times, if we're just not teaching and speaking the Word of God, it's going to have a subtle effect of having a negative effect on ourselves, our lives, and our entire society because we're not utilizing the Word of God. But when we do utilize the Word of God, we can avoid so much misery within our lives and we can provide for our nation and our neighbors and our states and our country and the world as we go out and witness and evangelize and bring peace and freedom and love to the entire world. So again, our words and our mouths are very important. And on the negative side, more often than anything else, more often than our actions, more often even than our thoughts, the words that come out of our mouths typically are the thing that cause self-induced misery within our lives. And again, that's not saying that our actions don't cause it and our thoughts don't cause it, but more often than not, the words that come out are the cause of the problems and difficulties within our lives and the chain sinning that can come along with it. Therefore, as the verse tells us, through the proper training and education of the young, whether that be the child or the spiritually immature individual, in the principles and precepts of God's Word, these sins and other subsequent problems that go along with it can be highly avoided. As I said before, this is not a guarantee that by teaching the child it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows, okay? They're not a guarantee. Their volition is always involved. The sin nature is still there. But what it does say is that there's a high probability of goodness being within their lives, especially as they continue to grow and uh, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and grow to spiritual maturity. Now, the last part of this phrase, we'll just spend a, a few minutes here. It says, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. What's interesting about this is that uh, when it says, even when he is old, uh, the word depart is the cow, which is the active voice in the Hebrew language, and it's the imperfect, continuous action case or stem, we would say. But the imperfect also can be a future tense as well. It's interesting in the Greek, there's a future tense and then there's an imperfect tense. And they distinguish one from the other. The future means, yeah, it's going to happen down the road. The imperfect is just ongoing action. So again, it has a slight futuristic uh, uh, aspect to it. The Hebrew combines those two in what's called the, uh, again, the, uh, the imperfect 
uh, tense or stem, or the cal active and then the imperfect tense in the Hebrew language. It combines the future and it combines continuous action. So that's in view here. W even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we have the negative low in the Hebrew in this, so you get the will not depart. In other words, in the future, he's not going to go off of the highway. He's going to not go down to the low road, the sinful road. He's not going to get down into the muck and mire of sin and evil inside of Satan's cosmic system. Through positive volition, based on the training he's received in the Word of God, he's going to stay on the high road. And he's going to continue to use that throughout his or her spiritual walk. So it's the active, continuous action of staying on that high road in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Continuing to walk righteously and holy as he goes forward. So that's what we have here in this principle. And we see again the importance of training up the child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. In other words, the doctrines that you learned in the past will be doctrines that you'll continue to utilize as you grow and go forward in the plan of God. And maybe you start off with something as simple as the Ten Commandments and you memorize the Ten Commandments and you remember what all of those principles are all about. They're going to be with you the rest of your life. And you're going to have a hard decision to make to break any one of those Ten Commandments, other than the, uh, the Sabbath, which we know is not for the, new, uh, the church age, uh, other than that. But the other nine commandments that we know continue to be for the church age, as we've proved uh, this past year when we studied out the Ten Commandments. But in any case, you're going to have a hard decision to break those. And it's going to be very conscious. And your conscience is going to be telling you, don't break it, don't break it. Or at least it's going to say, if you do, you know that it's sin. And it's going to break your fellowship with God. You know that God doesn't like this. And it's going to come back to your memory. And more often than not, you'll heed that conscious uh, uh, viewpoint and not break that commandment and not enter into sin. So you see how even when you are mature, these things will continue to work and function within your life. That's why we're going to see as we continue on in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 23, 13, and then also in Proverbs chapter 29, that should actually be verse 15, the two snuck in there by mistake, okay? So in uh, Proverbs 29, 15, as it should say at the bottom, basically Proverbs 23, 13 says, Do not hold back discipline from the child, although you beat him with the rod, he will not die okay so and again proverbs 29 15 is very much in line with that talking about discipline and it's better to have that discipline than for the individual to go down the path of the sin unto death or even be a child that never comes to salvation because they didn't learn the word of god and suffer the second death being thrown into the eternal lake of fire so again, we see discipline is necessary. The training is part of the discipline. And in this case, the rod, the spanking of a child, is something that is very necessary. And I'm sure many of you uh, may be familiar, and some of you may not be if you're of the younger generation. But back in the 70s, I think it was, this guy, Dr. Spock, and again, not the guy from Star Trek, but another Dr. Spock came out with a great book talking about you should not spank children and how bad it is to spank the children. Oh, yeah, well, the Word of God says over and over again, spare the rod, spoil the child. Nothing wrong with it. You don't use the rod abusively, but you use it with integrity and righteousness to teach and train as necessary. So, again, we see, uh, you know, how the world and Satan's cosmic system tries to counter the things of God, and that's what creates a fault in a negative society. But yet when we apply the Word of God, we have a much better society and a more probability for a good society going forward. So again, all of that had to do with training and teaching. And before I get to verse 7, I did want to read you one comment. And, and I don't have it on the board for you. It's long. It's in the notes. I pass out on Sunday as well. But a fellow by the name of Ironside, and he's got an uh, uh, expository commentary in the book of Proverbs. And in regard to all what we've been talking about, he says, if they, again talking about the children or the spiritually mature, are taught to love the world, to crave its fashions and follies in childhood, 
they are almost certain to live for the world when they come to mature years. On the other hand, if they are properly instructed from the beginning as to the futility of living for the pleasures of this world, they are in little danger of reversing that judgment as they grow older. Parents need to remember it's not enough to tell their little ones of Jesus and his rejection or to warn them of the ways of the world. They must see to it that in their own lives they exemplify their instructions. This will count above all else in the training of the young. Little ones will observe our pretense and hypocrisy if we speak piously of separation from the world while demonstrating the spirit of the world in our dress, relationships in the home, and friends we seek. We need not wonder, then, if they grow up to ignore our words of instruction while imitating what our lifestyle proclaimed to be the real object of our hearts. But where a holy, cheerful atmosphere pervades the home and godly admonitions uh, in co- is compelled with godly living, parents can count on the Lord to keep their household following in the right way. And he says, compare that to Second Timothy uh, verse 1. Five. So again, a great commentary. Again, our training and our teaching is not just what I say, but it's what I say plus what I do. And if what we do is not what we say, we're going to give an, a mixed message, and the child is going to go off and not and be confused, and probably will follow along in the negative aspect of our lifestyle inside of Satan's cosmic system. So again, our training uh, for children and also our training for the spiritually immature should be that of not entering them into worldly things, but entering them into the things of God and teaching them the things of God consistently as we also demonstrate that life within our own. That is the greatest teaching mechanism that you can have, your lifestyle, your life conduct. If you say you've loved the Lord and follow the Lord, then demonstrate that in what you do. All right, now moving on to verse 7, where we continue. You know, this uh, little verse of verse 6 isn't just thrown in there about training in the child and how he'll continue to go. It's the greater context of the right viewpoint, good reputation, treating the, the rich and the poor fairly and equally. And then we have another wisdom proverb that is given to us here in verse 7. And that reads, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. That's what we have in this passage. And again, talking about the rich and poor in comparison, which also goes down into the borrower and the lender. So again, in that comparison, we would say the lender would be the rich person and the borrower would be the poor person because they don't have enough resources and finances to live on their own. They need to borrow it from somebody else. And basically, it's saying that if we have that borrower's mentality, we're going to be a slave to the lender. So what this verse is all about is having good management of our finances, living within our means, and making sure that we don't get over indebted within our with our finances and not putting ourselves in a place of being indebted or slavery in slavery to another or to an institution now unfortunately as you know in the united states of america we've developed this whole system of purchasing homes and mortgages and now it's down to cars and now we even go from cars now down to furniture we go from furniture down into probably one day we'll be buying our food on loan and on with interest being applied to it. Many people may do that through credit cards and things like that. But again, you know, we've created a debt-ridden society, starting with our mortgages. And many people think, oh, I own my home, and it's my home, and this and that. No, it's not. It's not your home. The bank owns your home as long as they have the deed to your home. Until you've paid off that deed or and paid off that loan, it is not your home. Home. Even if you owe $1 left on your mortgage, it's still theirs until you've completely paid it off. And so as you upkeep your home and you manicure your yard, make sure that you have homeowner's insurance and make sure you, you know, replace the rotted wood and keep everything up, up to date and upkeep. Many times you think, oh, I'm doing this for myself so it looks good and I can enjoy this place that I'm living. No, you're not. You're doing it for the bank that owns your home. 
And, oh, by the way, the bank, if you aren't keeping up your home, they could com come in and demand that, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that. You need to upkeep this, you need to upkeep that. They can demand those things as they demand that you have homeowner's insurance in case any disaster or problem happens. So in any case, you know, that is the society that we've entered into. And unfortunately, there are very few individuals in our society today that can just go out and purchase a home for cash, okay? So they have to take out a mortgage. They have to take out a loan. And they are indebted, okay? It's part of society. We understand that. But as I say all of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll say as we go through these things, as this proverb says, you know, try not to be in debt, it never says we cannot ever be in debt. And actually, you know, the law of the Old Testament had rules for indebtedness and rules for lending. That we don't apply very good today either, but yet it doesn't say we should never have debt, okay? So don't ever think if you, because you have debt in a situation, oh, you're, you're sinning and you're breaking God's rules. No, you're not, okay? You can be indebted to another. But what it's telling us is that when we are indebted to another individual, there are consequences that come along with it. And you can be the slave or servant of the individual that you are indebted to. And it's interesting, as I said, you know, you know, what it used to, what, you know uh, when my parents bought their home, okay, you couldn't even buy a car today for what they paid for their home. Okay, 50 years ago, whatever the time frame was. And now we have mortgages on cars that are getting, used to be a two-year loan, a three-year loan. Now it's a five, six, seven-year loan for the car. People want to buy furniture for their homes. Now it's, oh, come, you know, no interest for, you know, five years or whatever, or 60 months or whatever the case may be. And it can be yours, okay? And you get the furniture, you get it home, and you find out it falls apart in three years. But you still have another two or three years, you're paying off that furniture. Great business decision that was made. But you still got to pay off the loan, even though you don't have the asset to go along with it. So in any case, this is trying to give us warning about good financial management and not to get ourselves in such a burden of debt that we cannot you know, live freely within a society. And as I'm going to share with you as we go into this, so I'll get it, uh, you know, there were, as I said, stipulations in the law that was given to Israel, that are principles that we can continue to apply today, but we don't in the sense that how they did. But again, principles as to how to borrow and how to lend, and then the consequences that if somebody got too indented, what would happen? All right, so we'll talk about that as we get into this. So all of this depicts life as is usual. The rich and the poor, okay? There's going to be rich, there's going to be poor. And typically the rich rules over the poor because they get all the money and they can call the shots because they've got the money where the poor have no power because they have no money. And again, you just scratch your head today when you look at political campaigns and you look at somebody who wants to be the dog catcher of a town and they have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to be the dog catcher of a town, okay? I'm just... Emphasi you know, emphasizing, but you know, you see that in the bigger scale of a state representative. They represent a small part of a, con a, a state, or they may even represent a state, and you see the millions and of billions of dollars that are being thrown into a campaign where somebody's going to make $100,000 a year, but yet they have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to get the job that's going to be a million dollars or excuse me, $100,000 a year. You have, to scratch, you have to think about that every now and again. I don't think we think about that too much. You know, Why do you need $100 million to get a job that's going to pay you $100,000? Hmm, because you're a slave. You're going to become a slave to the one who has the money, the one that purchased your election, the one that gave you the hundreds of millions of dollars so that you could run and campaign and hopefully win. And many times, you know, twisting it so that you do win, like we saw in our last presidential campaign, not with the guy who won, but with the person that lost, okay? In any case, twisting and turning and becoming a slave. And that's why, again, a a lot of po politics today, okay? But again, that's why I love our current president in the sense that what did he do? He used his own money for campaigning. 
And he said no to a lot of the big interests. He didn't use all his own money, but most of it. He said no to the big interests. Why? He didn't want to be a slave to them and have them tell him what to do when he is behind the desk of presidency. But prior to him, you've seen everybody else give in to the big money and receive the big PAC money and the money from this donation and that donation. Again, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, all the same. And what happens? When you get elected, now you've got to do what we tell you to do. And where's the freedom in that? Where's the volition in that? And the person you were electing that you thought you, uh, you, oh, you voted for them because you liked their viewpoint, it's not going to be their viewpoint that makes decisions going forward. It's going to be the big pack money viewpoint that makes the decisions going forward where it doesn't, you know, has nothing to do with you whatsoever. So again, the rich has the power. The rich tend to rule. That's a general principle of society. It's not God's plan for society, but it's a general principle of society inside of Satan's cosmic system. It depicts what's usual and the implication that the rich have access to power because of the money that they have or the money that's behind them that they are able to wield. A couple of interesting words that we have here. The word rules is marshal or mashal, and that means to rule, to govern, to have dominion. It talks about the power that they have. It's interesting that I gave you this word because there are two root definitions of this word. Okay, Two root definitions of this word. And the second one is what's applied here. The ruling, the governorship, and the dominion. But the first root meaning speaks of one who speaks in Proverbs. It's kind of interesting. That word mashal, it's another word for Proverbs. And we've seen this in the book of Psalms. Remember a mashal of David remember, or a mashal of this one or that one? Speaking of a proverb or a poem that is made. But a mashal basically is talking about uh, coming up with a phrase that has a contrasting as aspect to it. Speaking of proverb. And again, like we have here, the rich versus the poor. So when it talks about the ruler to govern or the dominion that they have, the inherent power and authority that's in their life, we also see the first main use of this word in its root being that proverbial speech. And it's making a contrast. That's what we can take away from this. It emphasizes the contrast between the rich and the poor because of the money and the power. Then when we get into the second half of this word, uh, of this phrase, I should say. It says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Lender is an interesting word here. Most of the Hebrew words here, other than that one I just gave you, are pretty much straightforward and straight up. Lender is a little different. just has an interesting nuance because it's the word ish in the Hebrew, which basically doesn't mean lender, just a man. It means man, husband, and sometimes it's defined as humankind. And basically, the English translators changed it from a man to a lender to continue the contrast between the bower, which is an actual Hebrew word, and that's la'ah, okay? Uh, uh, and we could say law, okay? <laughs> the law, okay? The bower. All right, but what I found interesting about the word lender for ish compared to the borrower is that it means a man. And so how is that kind of funny? Because you know how we always talk about the man? Oh, let's give it or stick it to the man. And we're talking about what? The one who has money, the one who has the riches, the one who has the power, the political leaders. Let's stick it to the man. Well, that's what this word says here, okay? The man who you are borrowing from. That's what's in view here. Uh, but God's not saying stick it to the man. He's basically saying you become a slave of that man, the one you are borrowing from. And so the borrower becomes the slave, and here it's the word, and it's spelled E-B-E-D in the Hebrew. You can see the Hebrew up there on the board from right to left, even though we read left to right. But it's, it's pronounced, the B sometimes is pronounced as a V, so it's a ved. And basically, that means a slave or a servant. And that's what the borrower becomes to the man who they borrow the money from. They become his slave or his servant. And so that's what we have to realize when we are indebted to somebody else. 
when we have to borrow to buy this or to buy that. We're indebted to the one we're borrowing to. And unfortunately, we're also developing a generation that thinks that money is free and it grows on trees and the government just gives me stuff and I have no indebtedness to them. Oh, no, 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 no. You are their slave. And again, when we have a drastic welfare state like we do, you're in slavery to the government. And they're going to determine places where you can live and where you can buy and what you can afford and what you can't afford. And your freedom's taken right out of it. And you think, oh, I've got my free cheese, I get my free milk, I get my stuff, and I have you know, these things. You may even have a little apartment somewhere. But none of that was determined by your freedom of choice. None of that was determined by you going out and making a way for yourself where you could have much, much more than the measly little scraps that the government throws at you. But the government wants you to be indebted to them in a welfare state so that they can control you much, much better and much, much more. So again, whether it be a welfare state, indebtedness to the government, or whether it be in the economic sense where we're you know, borrowing money to be able to purchase things, we are indebted to that individual that we're borrowing from or that we're taking from in that case. And so we are a slave to that individual, and we become slaves to them. And so this is a warning not to get into too much debt within our lives. And that also goes along with Romans 13, 8, which we read already. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. There was a context there about honoring your government in Romans 13. And then also how we treat one another. Owe nothing to anyone. You know, don't owe taxes to your government. Pay your taxes when your taxes are due. Don't become a slave to the government because you're not paying your taxes. Earn money so that you can pay taxes and pay it as you should. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Don't be indebted to anyone. And then it goes on into all the other sins that we could commit that would create indebtedness to other people. But in our passage here in Proverbs 22.7, it's talking about borrowing money the lender and the borrower. And so if we heed this principle, we will escape the bondage of being a debtor. And that's what God designs for us. That's the way he would like us to be. Again, there are rules and principles for borrowing and lending in the Old Testament. Nothing wrong with borrowing and lending, okay? But being overwhelmed with debt is not godly. So we have to manage it. And if you get in debt and you borrow, you should calculate and plan with wisdom that you're able to pay off the debt and make a wise decision before borrowing that money. Because once you borrow that money, you are now enslaved to that individual. And in fact, in the law in Hebrew society, if somebody got in debt and the debt came due and they couldn't pay it, Today we just, you know, file a bankruptcy, chapter 11, chapter 13, whatever, you know, whatever chapters, and, oh, you just walk scot-free. Oh, sorry, my debt, oh, sorry about that, I'm just walking away, okay? And that's no way to treat a society either. You know, you incurred all this, you should pay it back, okay? But in the Old Testament, if somebody got in debt and they couldn't pay it back, they then would have to become the servant, or we could also call it slave, of that individual. And many times they'd sell their kids into slavery. Their children would have to go and pay the debt by being the servants of that, that, uh, the, the lender at least for seven years until the sabbatical year came. We're giving them an opportunity uh, uh, for freedom. Well, I should say the Sabbath year, as it would come, giving them an opportunity for freedom at the end of the seven years. So again, God had a plan and a system within society. And if somebody got in too much debt then and they couldn't repay it within the time frame it was due, they would then have to indenture themselves to another. But yet if we have wisdom and we apply these principles as best we can and not be overwhelmed with debt within our lives, we'll escape many problems and difficulties and miseries. And we won't have the slavery. We'll have instead what? Freedom to function and operate within l- our life. And not be serving the man all of our lives. 
So again, that's the principle that we're seeing here. And we're seeing that part of Satan's cosmic system is that the na it's natural that the lender would consider himself to be superior to borrowers. You see, that's another aspect of this. With the sin nature, the rich who have all the money, you know, they, they get high and you know, falutin in their mentality and their nose gets a little bit up in the air. They think they're better than everybody else because of the stuff that they got. And that's whether they earned it or whether it's a windfall or maybe they had some talent as a musician or an actor and they think, oh, I'm better than everybody else because I've got money. Look at me. It's a natural tendency inside of Satan's cosmic system. But as we've already read in verse 2 and what this verse is also telling us is that everybody is the same in the eyes of God. We have one maker. And we shouldn't look, if we have money and we are rich, we shouldn't be looking down upon the poor. And if we're poor, we shouldn't be looking enviously and jealously at the rich. Because both incur sin, starting with mental attitude that can lead to verbal sin and problems within their life. So as much as verse 7 is a warning to the poor, as it were, or the borrower, as much as it's a warning to them to be cautious and careful in their borrowing, it is also a warning to the rich lender to not be high and mighty about your ability to lend. Because who gave you that money to be able to lend in the first place? Your creator, your maker. Because it all came from him. And so therefore you shouldn't be highfalutin in your attitude about the lenders that are bow excuse me, the borrowers that you are lending to and lord it over them in a tyrannical way. So again, this is a message going both to the rich and to the poor. For the poor, not getting in too much debt where it becomes detrimental in your life and you are enslaved, and to the rich who are lenders, not to lord it over the poor where you have all kinds of mental sins and maybe uh, overt sins and verbal sins that now start to spew in your life and the arrogance complex of your sin nature. Again, a warning not to enter into those things. Instead, have great responsibility with the power that has been given to you. And if you have money that then deems that you have certain power and authority within life, you have a great responsibility and a greater responsibility to be a holy and righteous citizen of that country and of the family of God to use that power and to use it well and to use it for those who have need. Give when you need to give. Help where you need to help and not just lord it over everybody and set yourself up in your own little fiefdom. Verses 9 and 16 of our chapter speak more about that as well as Proverbs uh, 18.23 and also 19.17. Proverbs 19.17 says, One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his good deed. You see, that's the attitude we should have. If I'm lending to the poor, I'm really giving it to God. I'm helping His plan go forward. And I'm helping a fellow child of God in that situation. And God will repay him for his good deeds. Nothing can crush the spirit of a man more than having overwhelming debt within his life. That can be very crushing to individual. Because sometimes you just look and it's like, there's no way I'm getting out of this. I can't do it. And in the ancient days, uh, uh, unfortunately, they would have to sell themselves into slavery as a result. And now they would lose their freedoms. In our society, we're a little bit softer in, the, in that term and what's happening, which has gone too far maybe the other way and has other detrimental effects within society. But again, getting in debt can be crushing to the spirit and can de uh, debilitate the Christian walk of an individual. Therefore, we as believers should flee at all costs from allowing the enemy to use the weight of debt to crush the soul of ourselves and also of other individuals and let him undermine the harmony and the peace and the, uh, the joy and the happiness and the freedom that otherwise that individual should have within their soul. And by depending on another individual to buy you out or to you know, get you out of a, a, a problem or a difficulty also voids that individual from their dependence on the Lord. 
You see, when you have freedom, you're in total dependence of the Lord. When you're indebted to somebody else, you're dependent upon them. And you lose some of that Christian walk and that relationship that you otherwise would have had with God. And that's why Satan wants a society of debt. And again, I could go on in politics about the debt of our nation and the borrowing that we have from other nations so that we can be, you know, survive. We used to be the lenders to others. And, you know, I always scratch my head, too, because, you know, we've got this debt that they talk about. I don't even think it's real. I don't think, I think it's just made up numbers. Because when you get to that trillions, and it's, it's like, it's made up. You're never going to pay that back. Who are we kidding here? Okay? But we continue to borrow money from one country, and yet we're the biggest givers of money to everybody else. But we borrow, and as if we have to pay back interest on that money, when we freely give it to all these other nations. Hmm? That doesn't make sense. Why don't you just let that country give the money to everybody else? Why do we have to be the middleman? Quit giving it away. Let them do it. And again, I know that all the politics, oh, keep them on our side and keep them as an ally. You know, it's just, it's just a shell game. It's all a big scam, okay? And it's another bondage, form of bondage for our nation, for our people, etc., etc. All right, moving on. And the principle that we saw in the ancient days, and again that we see in the law, is that if someone could not pay off their debt, they or their children would be brought into slavery and ultimately be servants to the lender. We talked about that. There's the passages, so I'm going to quickly go over that. Got a couple of more things. Just want to get done. I'm a little over time, but almost done. So therefore, those who borrow, whether by necessary or choice, voluntarily put themselves under slavery, under the power of the rich. And we saw a principle, and we see principles in Deuteronomy 28, that Israel's ability to grant loans to the heathen nations was a sign of God-given prosperity. But yet, when Israel had need to borrow from those nations, it was a clear sign of the absence of God's blessings within their own country and within their own nation. And that's a principle for any client nation going forward. Yet the Bible does not forbid the making of loans. Got you some scriptures there. We've talked about that. However, financial and social bondage can be the result. Or financial and social bondage can be the result of entering into debt. Let me say it that way. Therefore, extreme caution is to be had by the wise so that they don't incur too much debt and therefore put themselves in bondage. So the last point is that if we are uh, to be walking properly as servants unto the Lord, remember that word servant we saw here, child, na'ah, talking about the servant, not just the child. Again, if we want to walk as servants unto the Lord, we cannot be filled with debt. To walk as a servant of God, we cannot fulfill that f mandate if we are filled with debt within our lives. And if we are servants to another, the creditor or the man. Okay, so again, if you take anything else away, don't be indebted to the man, okay? You're supposed to stick it to the man, not be indebted to the man, okay? That's what you're supposed to do, all right? Just kidding. All right, but in any case, that's what we have, and those are the principles that we take away from verse 7. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. We thank you for these principles so that we can learn about being good servants unto you and having great wisdom in regard to our finances and treatment of finances and treatment of one another, whether we be rich or poor or vice versa. So, Father, we just thank you for this word, and we ask that this wisdom resonate in our lives as we demonstrate your word to a lost and dying world. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask for your blessings on our way home. In Christ's name, amen. All right.